Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Relational AI webinar series, uh, where we'll talk about everything data, AI, and the role that relational knowledge graphs play in the construction of data-centric applications, or what some may call intelligent applications. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Bob Mugliot. Um, thanks for joining us today, Bob. Great I don't to be here, John. Thanks. Uh, Bob, I don't think you you need an introduction, but I'll give you an introduction. Uh, you were a longtime executive at Microsoft. Uh, you were the CEO of Snowflake during the formative years of the company. Uh, you're a very active investor in the data and AI space. Uh, now, I, I think you can probably say that uh, you're an accomplished author with uh, the Datapreneurs book, uh, which, which people can find a link to that book and, and to learn more on that. So welcome and uh, congratulations on the book, Bob. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll say in the mode of full disclosure, I, uh, Bob and I have known each other for over a decade. Uh, I had the pleasure to work for Bob at Microsoft when he was leading the server and tools organization there. Um, and so uh, we also have board here, uh, excuse me, Bob here on our board. Um, he's an active member of the relational AI team. And uh, so today we'll talk a little about uh, data and AI. We'll talk about the role of relational knowledge graphs. Um, and uh, Bob will share some of in insights from uh, datapreneurs. Excellent. So I, uh, I thought we would start, uh, if we sort of go back to maybe our shared time at Microsoft and sort of where, where we were, uh, you know, sort of the we as, a, as an industry, if we look at data and where data was roughly around 2010, 2011, when you were uh, you know, leaving Microsoft, um, if we think about where data was and the, all of the investments in big data, um, a lot of Hadoop companies were getting funded. There was a lot of froth around that. Um, and then we also had on the application side and operational database side, uh, we had a lot of NoSQL databases. We had, you know, MongoDB was, uh, you know, the rallying all of the developers around the world to for a new type of uh, application development using uh, non-relational technology. So uh, the question I have for you is, uh, as we read uh, datapreneurs and you sort of recount the arc of data, um, if I look at that, the thing that's striking is none of those players really play a role as we talk about the, the datapreneurs. So I'm, I'm curious to get your take on that in, in terms of where, where things were um, and then where we, we've gotten to. You know, I talk about that period as the Wild West of data and BI. It was a time when there was a lot of, of, of churn and a, lot, and a lack of understanding and, frankly, a lack of effective technology. I think there are differences in things. You know, you talk about Mongo, and and the impact that 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 semi-structured or document databases have had. Uh, I think that's significant. I believe that 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 is an appropriate way to structure operational applications. Although I do believe there are deficiencies in most of, in fact, pretty much all of the the document and NoSQL databases. That make them hard to use for one reason or another. Mostly, it, they're having to do with transactional consistency and the ability to, to work and operate relationally. Because there's nothing inconsistent about storing data in a document data model, a semi-structured data model, you know, structured similar to JSON. There's nothing inconsistent with that in the relational and relational technology. It's just that the databases haven't done that. And in fact, you know, I've been working for several years. Um, with the team, the Fauna team, to build a uh, a, a NoSQL uh, document-oriented database. They call it a document relational database that uses the data model of semi-structured document data, but applies re relational technologies and, of most importantly, strictly serialized transactional consistency across collections. Fundamentally, these these models are interesting. But they are not; they have not had the transactional consistency and the characteristics that are needed for typical business transactions and business applications. There's nothing fundamental about this; they just weren't built that way originally. Now, with Fauna, you can have that. So this this is, I think, very. This one, I think, is important. But I literally don't think the technology matured to the point where it was leverageable broadly until about a month ago when Fauna released its 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 new version of FQL that brings all of this out. So this is new from my perspective, and I think it's very exciting. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Can I ask you, Bob, do, do you just, think... It took a long time. It took a yeah. long time. I mean, you, you were very involved in the early days of, of SQL and SQL Server. Do you, do you feel like technologies and systems like that can adapt to support these models? No, no they can't. And, and, and the issue, I, I mean, I just wrote, in fact, I just wrote a paper that's published on the Fauna blog call, called Relational is More Than SQL. The fundamental issue comes down to the fact that SQL, you know, which we have to remember was designed in the mid-1970s, Okay, that's when it was originally designed and kind of came to fruition in the 1980s. You know, most of SQL was present by SQL 1990. And uh, that technology is designed to work with structured tables. And structured tables are a very, very useful and data structure that's very general purpose. It can be applied to a lot of things. It's ideal for slicing and dicing data for analytics and it makes it very very easy to do that which is why data warehouses now that they have the ability to scale have taken on the role of being coming the the data the data chefs the data slicer dicers of the world and and that's what people are using regardless of whether it's snowflake or databricks or microsoft fabric or bigquery or redshift yeah. well i mean that let us move transformation into the the database data which hardly lived outside the database for a long time but the issue comes if what you want is a data model that doesn't look like a structured table that's mm -hmm. where the issues really hit and you know, to me, when I think of an operation, operational application, which is an application used by people, okay, most of the applications, almost everything we're familiar with, are 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 people-oriented operational applications where you have some kind of form and you're responding in some way. If you look at the natural data model that exists inside that JavaScript or that Python or that Java application that's running it, the natural data model is a nested hierarchy because it's it, it it's an object oriented. These are object oriented right. languages, and they serialize naturally into effectively JSON. Right. So that data model is the perfect data model for working with people oriented operational applications. But until now, literally until like a month ago, there was not a product that had the transactional consistency and relational capabilities that you would expect in a SQL database to work with that data model. SQL will never be appropriate for that data model because it's so focused on the table. And, you know, you can stretch SQL to work and you can, you, you know, there's all people say, oh, I can make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can make it work. But is that really what you want to do? Don't you want something that just works the way you want it to work? Mm -hmm. um, so to me, for those cl that class of applications, it's very interesting to look at different data models. And by the way, not all people applications fall into this. You know, some things are very static in their nature. They, they don't change over time. And in that case, if I was building a general ledger system, I'd use a SQL database. No question about it. That's what I would use. But if I were building a billing system or a marketing system, I wouldn't use a SQL database today. I would use a, a database that is much more dynamic and, and, and fits and fits the data model. Um, likewise, this has been the pursuit that we've had with relational AI in the analytics side of this to take the world beyond the structured table into different data structures, into the knowledge graph, and then applying advanced re relational technology to work against data of different shapes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the world's going to be doing. I think that's, you know, SQL is not going to go away. It's going to remain very important. Um, I think it becomes more of an intermediate language as, as AI models begin to allow people to make queries in English. But it will, SQL will remain a very, very critical part of data infrastructure for decades. Um, but I do believe these other data models and other languages will emerge for people to work with data in different shapes than a structured table. Yeah, and I think if we get, as we move towards these other data models, then there can be modularity constructs on top of these other data models that actually allow for tabular representations of data. But we'll, maybe we'll, we'll jump into uh, SQL in, in a minute, but I want to I wanna go back uh, for a moment to the Wild West. Uh, ah, time to the Wild West. So, so during the Wild West, in the time of the Wild West, uh, Bob gets on his horse and decides he's going to join the founders of, of Snowflake, uh, which... At that time, I think for all of us now, we're like, obviously, obviously you would make that choice and, and you would go join uh, Snowflake in its early days and the potential of that technology and the potential disruption it can cause. It's the, the biggest IPO of, of we've ever seen. And so 
it, it seems obvious to everyone now. It was certainly not obvious, you know, no, back in 2011, 2012, uh, 2013. So what, what, tell us about sort of what led to that. You took a bit of an unconventional leap to say that, you know, this relational model does have gas in it. There's still gas in the tank. And so uh, I'd love to hear about that. Well, you know, remember back in like 2010, 2011, 2012, if you use the word SQL, you better put the word no in front of it. Right, that's right. <laughs> or it was, or you were, or you were like the old school. You were in yeah. the old school of things. Yeah. Um, well, you, do you remember, uh, you know, back in the Microsoft days of uh, um, Eric Meyer running around and trying to, trying to tell people there is something else. There's another my, uh, model. Um, well, you know, I I had known that something was wrong for years because because and I wrote this in the book that we had tried repeatedly to make Exchange and Outlook sit on top of SQL Server and we failed horrifically every time we tried to do it. And fundamentally, it was a mismatch of data model because again, I come back to the structure table as the core of what SQL works with, and and those applications wanted to have a dynamic data model that typically looks more document oriented in, in its structure or semi structured. Um, so I knew there was something else. And this is why the NoSQL thing was complicated, because like I say, there really is a purpose for what Mongo is trying to do. And now what Fawn is trying to do to take that to the next level. There, was, there are classes of applications. And in fact, I think most operational applications would fit well with with different data models. Um, up to now, it's been more uh, 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 eventual consistency, mail apps, sort of chat app, things like that mm -hmm. seem tend to be more of the kind of things that, that those databases apply to. And, and certainly they're much more appropriate for that. So part of the reason there was so much confusion was there really were issues of things, people are trying to do things with SQL where it couldn't be, it couldn't use it. You know, in, in likewise, in the analytics space, we were working with, we we're trying to work with semi-structured data. What was happening is your business systems were all structured Oracle systems, but but then underneath those applications were web applications and they were throwing off all sorts of log data. And there was incredibly useful analytics inside that log data because it showed user behavior. Mm -hmm. And particularly for advertising and a whole bunch of things that were emerging in that period, that data was very important. And no SQL database of that era could handle semi-structured data, which is why people turn to solutions like Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Hadoop always puzzled me. I mean, it was it, it was an enigma to me because it never smelled right to me. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just felt wrong. I was never a huge fan of MapReduce in the beginning. I always felt that relational algorithms had some superior characteristics. And certainly there were people whispering in my ear that were database people telling me that all along. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I watched as customers were trying to use Hadoop and struggling with it, frankly. And it seemed like it was it was a monster, frankly, that people mm -hmm. were just, you know, were trying to corral. And frankly, generally unsuccessfully. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there were some successful success cases, but those were really smart people at companies. Most people struggled with it. Do you and think so, that was because of the operational complexity of those systems? Because it was or... broken to begin with. It was the wrong thing to do. It was, it was not, you know, when something is not correct, Sometimes you can make it work, but it doesn't work very well. No. And that's why that's why, like I sort of talk about how, you know, in operational apps, there's an opportunity to move beyond SQL there. Likewise, you know, th there was an issue associated with using Hadoop to try and analyze semi-structured data that algorithmically it wasn't working the way it was, it was not working in an optimal way. And, and, and the database people would talk about the inefficiencies all the time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Hadoop basically is a brute force kind of a mechanism. It's not a smart system like, a, like today's modern data warehouses are. And so I didn't know what was right. I mean, I'm not smart enough to say, you know, this is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I found Benoit and Terry in 2014, and I was looking, I knew the cloud was the future. I knew that there was tremendous opportunity for data analytics and things, but I didn't know what to do. And that's just my typical thing. I mean, I'm I'm a guy that helps make things happen, but the brilliance comes from these entrepreneurs, these datapreneurs that have these incredible ideas. And when I heard what Benoit and Terry said, you know, the founders of Snowflake said about what they were building and how they were building it, leveraging 
a you know a multi-tier architecture where you separate compute from storage and you leverage the blob storage capabilities of S3 for long-term persistence. You know, they're building a true database. I mean, it had true snapshot level consistency, which is what's appropriate for an analytic database like, like Snowflake. And and you know, from a perspective of a typical SQL user, it was just another SQL database. The hmm. biggest difference is that the architecture was different, and that architecture allowed the system to scale and work with data at, at sizes that were unheard of and the number of users that were unheard of. In, in, and I knew that, that was a bottleneck. I knew that was a huge bottleneck. So once I heard it, it was like, if this thing works, it's going to change the world. And I mean, there were there were a number of bets there, like that that bet in saying cloud native, this architecture. If we think back to that time. I mean, there were not a lot of people building cloud native. Yeah, that database. was obvious to me. We had, you remember, this comes back to the conversation you and I had years ago at Microsoft <laughs> with Rolf, who, where we, we yes. argued, but goes, going back to, to Rolf Harms, who's a, a, an analyst, a, a, a very brilliant business analyst at Microsoft. And, and back in, what was it, 2009, 2008, yeah. I think, yeah. he wrote a white paper that talked about the future being cloud. The economics now, of the cloud. Yes, it was a it was eventually published. Okay, and, and it's available. It's actually a, a very good paper. And Fantastic. It was quite it was quite foresight. Had a lot of foresight. The original one that you and I saw, the one that was that was never published, was even more brutal than mm -hmm. the one the one he had. I mean, he just viewed the world was going to go completely to cloud. He was more right than wrong, right? Yeah. He was more right. And remember, I was at Juniper before I joined Snowflake, and we were working with trying to build cloud systems with OpenStack. And I eventually came to the conclusion that OpenStack was a piece of garbage and was going to go nowhere, um, and that nobody could make that thing work. Nobody could make that thing work. And and so at that point, I realized the cloud was going to win, and and actually the on-premises cloud clouds we're, we're going to be swept away by and large with the, these large public clouds. Um, yeah, I it's, it's interesting now that we see, and I I, I know you recently uh, had a sat down with Soma to sort of talk about the cloud landscape. And so we've certainly had the the major cloud service providers, but now we we have these data clouds, these Snowflake data cloud, the, you know, Databricks and what they're trying to do with their sort of cloud. Um, so it's interesting to sort of see that, Super uh, cloud, the, the, the super, super cloud. clouds. Um, so I like overlay cloud better. That seems cor more correct to me. But super cloud sort of sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, so I think that that uh, that bet and a, a number of decisions that were made early in Snowflake, the relational model, uh, cloud native, and sort of that architecture of separating compute and storage. Though you know, it seems like these are obvious to us now. We're not. Uh, I think obvious to everyone at that time, because I even remember back in the time at Microsoft, uh, you know, ten plus years ago, where there was a lot of debate on the whether the world, even acceptance of Rolf's paper, was was not broadly accepted. I think across the company at that time, it became obvious over time. But uh, but you know, when you're a small company, you got to make some bets. You know, you got to bet on some things. And I think the cloud was a good bet. It was an easy bet to make, you know, even in 2013, 20, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. And, you know, what Benoit and Terry realized, which is, you know, the original thing was they thought that that it was about storage. And in fact, that was what, you know, the, the, the founding venture capitalist, Mike Spicer, his original thesis was that flash-based storage was going to change data analytics. And Terry came in and said, no, no, that's not the real key. The real key is compute. It's mm -hmm. all about compute. Um, uh, you know, operational apps are I/O bound, and and Flash is, is I mean, Flash is great no matter what because it makes everything faster. But 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 IOPS was really important for operational apps. Was really critical for analytics is CPU, and so the ability to scale up CPU dynamically, which you can do in the cloud, is is an unbelievable advantage. Yeah, um, because it's very bursty, and so why pay for the hardware all the time? And, and now we see, you know, every data system, every database snapping, snapping to this architectural model oh, yeah. really in the, the analytics space. So maybe maybe we can talk a little about um, data apps. So in, in your book, uh, you describe data apps as applications that respond to data and, and not people. Um, Simple. 
pretty can simple you, definition. Can you talk a little more about you know what makes those applications distinct and maybe give some examples uh, that you know people may be familiar with? I mean, they're super obvious. I mean, in some senses, I mean, almost everything you work with is an operational people. What I would call a people app. It's designed to work with people. You know, whether that's you know you're inputting, you're buying something, you're you're inputting a form for some for a doctor's visit or something you're doing. Those are all operational apps that are working with people. Behind the scenes, you know, those apps are those apps are collecting that data. They're they're performing actions. They're doing things you know that that are appropriate for whatever the process they're dealing with. And then that data, as it's being collected, can be used to um, take action um, on behalf of the company or on behalf of the user. That's what a data app does. It, it looks for changes in data state and, and it, it takes some kind of action. The most simple of which, which is like if you have a doctor's appointment or something, you know, a data app will look and note and send you a reminder when it's there. Mm -hmm. They'll make sure you fill things out. Those are all data apps. They're sort of sitting behind the scenes. And you know, then they interact with, then they become people apps if, if you have to do something. If you have to input your credit card or input a form, that, then there's a people app that kind of comes up and does that. Most of the apps that are data apps today are, are alerting oriented applications in some mm -hmm. sense, and it's the simplest type of data application. But we're gonna see more and more complexity occurring um, as people begin to build systems that, that need to, um, that work with the, a mass of data that's, that's in there. And then perform more complicated complicated steps, and that is going to be enabled in a significant way by the machine learning and artificial intelligence systems that can be hooked up. That's why all the data vendors. If you look at you know, there's five data platforms today: Snowflake and Databricks, uh, Microsoft Fabric, B Google BigQuery, and then the Amazon set of products around Redshift. Um, you know, all of them are viable in some senses today. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have my favorite. But uh, uh, but but those products can all you know can all be used, and uh, uh, and those companies are all building the infrastructure to allow you to see changes in the data and then take actions and respond for it. In other words, build data applications. Well, well you um, it's interesting, and you mentioned some of these companies that I think we characterize as sort of some of the foundational pieces of the modern data stack platforms. Some of those platforms. But I think it was also interesting that you characterize data apps today as jury-rigged affairs, I believe is the, the words that were used. So can you talk a little about like what, what that means or some of the challenges that uh, people face today in, in building these data-centric applications? Well, I think the number one thing really that exists is that the, the, the model for the application and is in the design for it is highly scattered in today's system. You have some of the data being coded in SQL, some of the data is coded in Python, some of the data is mm -hmm. coded in this, it's here, there, everywhere. And I think we're gonna move to a world where the database plays a much more fundamental role in these applications by storing what I think of as the semantic model for the business. And this is a really important distinction because there's semantic models for data and those are really interesting. But then sitting above that is, is the model of the business. Mm -hmm. And this is what the business is all about. And it's every rule that exists inside that business. Mm -hmm. Where does that semantic model, for any company you can think of, any company, where does that model exist? The answer is in many places, typically. Yeah. And you know it's in applications some of which were written, you know, bespoke applications written by companies, you know, where the code is accessible. Much of it is in SaaS applications, which are largely opaque. Um, it's sitting in SQL queries. It's sitting in Slack messages. It's sitting on whiteboards. It's sitting in people's yep. heads. It's all over the place. I think it's going to be very beneficial as we can define these semantic models and actually begin to execute them directly. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the key, and that's the sort of the insight that 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 makes a knowledge graph, in particular, a relational knowledge graph, different, is that it becomes an executable model that and, can can perform actions on behalf of the business. And do you think I think you characterize what you described as sort of some some of this being represented in SQL, some of this in Python as the the two language problem that exists today. Do you see that uh, 
that two language problem is, is something that's tractable that we can solve in, as we look. Look, I think a multi it's a multi language problem, really, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's going to. I don't know that that world changes completely. I don't think it changes in any time soon because we live in a complex hybrid world of many different systems, and at no point do you ever go, "Oh, so I'm just going to." wipe them all away and start again. I mean, you don't do that. You know? We would love to say that as technology ventures. <laughs> and you get to do it, by the way, when you start a new company from scratch. I mean, that's the one time you kind of get to do it is you say, okay, I'm brand new. I can build this whole thing from scratch. But you know, you're, so you spend five minutes in that state. You make your first decision. You make your first decision and that's your first legacy that you just, you, whatever your first system you brought in, that's your first legacy that you just yeah. created, that you just created. And and so you know the real question is how can you augment these things and 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 actually evolve them in a rational way because they're all all these businesses are airplanes in flight essentially mm -hmm. you have to think about how you're 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 modifying the engines carefully right I mean you 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 can make those decisions even as a new company and a new technology but then you you as as you engage with customers and organizations you get pulled into the real world and the real world is very messy um and yeah, everything's messy choices. and and time makes everything more messy too i mean cuz cuz you know a powerpoint presentation can be perfect <laughs> that's right <laughs> no no product ever is <laughs> so so you you spoke a little earlier about sequel and the role of sequel and um even a a, a post that you've had recently about a sequel in the book you you made a provocative statement that is the the days of SQL's dominance are are numbered. Um, and so I want I want to give you an opportunity to, to maybe explain that a little more in, in particular as someone that might be characterized as a relational maximus uh, and say and and so what what do you mean by that? And yeah, and I guess I am a relational maximus and I'm a SQL lover too, by yeah. the way. I'm not I mean I love SQL. I think SQL and it's certainly been very good to me. Um, but but uh, uh, I just see the limitations of it, and fundamentally, it comes down to the limitations of of the tabular data structure. And um, a, a, you know, yes, you can extend SQL to work with semi-structured data. Snowflake and others have shown you can do that. It is usually the first thing you do with that is you flatten it into a table. <laughs> That's usually the first thing you do is you get it out of that format into a format you can now work with it easily in a SQL database, which of course is a table. And so the, you know, SQL can work with this data and it, it but it it's not a natural to work and to work with different shapes of data. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, Operational applications, you know, obviously typically are modeled in third normal form or something close to that. And um, and you have to transform your internal data structures of the app to the database format. Likewise, if you're trying to do something that if you're trying to build these more complicated data apps, if you want to model something other than tabular data, you really need something other than SQL. I mean, SQL is the de facto language for working with tables. But I think the tables, while incredibly useful as a data structure, are quite limiting and inappropriate in some cases. Do you think that so you talk about the, the limiting factors on the data structure side, but let's talk about SQL as a, a language. Um, do, you, do you feel like-, like... It's like Visual Basic. I mean, it's been around forever, known by a lot of people. It's not the cleanest language in it. If you were, if you were to design a language today, you would not design SQL. I mean, SQL yeah. kind of looks like COBOL because sort of that was the era it came from. It's 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 not a good match really for modern modern. Well, well in particular, as you talk about sort of the, the uh, people-centric applications and the interfaces for data of people-centric applications, uh, and then in increasingly, as we see these language models being more prevalent in use uh, as as sort of in an in interface in terms of like how do we speak to applications, consume data, um, and then is SQL appropriate to bridge that oh, way. it will. SQL will bridge a lot of that. I mean, SQL will be used to bridge a ton of that. I mean, there there are about a hundred different companies out there trying to build English to SQL query products. Um, uh, I think I'm invested in a couple of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, and some eventually they will succeed. Eventually they will succeed. Uh, uh, and certainly Microsoft is working on this with with things like Power BI. Mm -hmm. uh, the big thing is everybody has come to the same conclusion. Everybody who's trying to work this problem has come to the same conclusion, which is you can make a very cool demo with four tables 
you know, and a little bit of data and show English to SQL. But if you want to do a real world thing for a real application, those language models need a semantic model behind them to help them understand what the data is. This is not surprising. Yeah. Every human, you know, when a human writes SQL, they have a semantic model in their head that they're using to write this SQL. Yeah. If we want a, a, an artificial intelligence system, we have to provide it with that semantic model somehow. Well, it's interesting, you know, any any BI analyst, any business analyst on the planet, the first thing that they do when they walk up to a database is like, I, I don't understand any of these tables and any of these columns and like, I need to layer my semantic understanding. And so you end up creating a BI semantic model, but, but right. those things get, as you said, sort of where, the, in the two language problem or the multi language problem, now they're trapped in you know the all of these systems and yeah, the systems. They're in the head of this analyst, but not in the head of that analyst, right? Because yeah, because yeah. you've got three different analysts, and this one knows this, this one doesn't know that, and and you know this is where 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 is the semantic model actually created? It's in the BI tool by and large today. Mm -hmm. Yeah which is clearly the wrong place for it. Well, in particular, as we look at data applications. And right, because the data apps need this semantic model, so we need to pull it back into the platform. And this is where I think everybody has kind of come to the same conclusion. We need this. We need a database to store this in. <laughs> and we don't know what that database is. I know what the database is. It's called relational AI. Yeah, well, that, um, that's a, maybe a good segue. Uh, so uh, part four of your book, uh, talks about a model, a model driven world. I think this is sort of getting to the, the essence of, of what we're talking about here and sort of semantics and the utility of semantics. Um, but sort of back, like if we talk about the, you know, how obvious were some of the snowflake choices, you know, 10 years ago, I think maybe we're in a similar place now, just in terms of how obvious are some of the choices that we need to make to pull those semantics back into the, the data layer. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious in your book, you talk about you know, how you got introduced to relational AI. Um, you, in particular, you talk about a, a four-hour meeting with Moham, who's our, our CEO, um, that you were very excited about, but I, I think you even caveated that by saying, you know, I maybe understood 20% of, of what was covered in this, this conversation. I mean, I, I, I have a similar experience. You and I, Bob, spoke uh, over two years ago. It was a 2021. I remember taking a walk in Seattle and you're like, you got it. The, the, dog, dogs. Right? the dogs came with us um, and uh, we had a chat about relational AI. You gave me a bunch of links and a bunch of papers to go read and all of which I had to read at least five times to really absorb and understand uh, what was happening there. But I, I'd like to get your perspective on like what what really was it that you heard in the, some of those initial discussions that you felt like um, the, the, the team was onto something? Remember how I said like when I was watching the Hadoop stuff happen, I, I I looked and said, I know this is wrong, but I don't know what the right answer is. Hmm. And then Benoit Terry talked, I had a conversation with Benoit Terry and I was, this is the right answer. And if it works, then it's going to replace all this other stuff. I had a similar situation with Moham and that really was what it was about. When I was running Snowflake, um, most of our our serious large customers use Databricks with Snowflake. They're both Databricks. And so I think that's still true today, by the way. I think that mo many companies still use both products. Um, uh, and, you know, when people would try and use Databricks for machine learning or they'd use it for machine learning, you know, they would build these feature tables um, that if it came out of a database like Snowflake, you know, it was a pretty big query. They would build these super wide, super big tables that you know would produce a lot of information, massive amounts of data that they would then run machine learning on. These are the, the these is the uh, the tensors that that essentially they yeah. apply, and uh, it just sort of was odd to me that the, those tables were often larger than the database itself that was being created. And yet they were lossy in information. They lacked the understanding of the relationships that were already in the relational database. And then I found out people were actually building algorithms to try and recreate those relationships which existed in the database. So I'm like, this is not, this is something missing here. And catch, missing. capture the semantics of that data through the features. The features yeah, absolutely. try and capture it, the semantics and the features and the features don't capture it. It's just, it's very difficult. Yeah. And, 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 this is exactly one of those cases where 
this doesn't feel right to me, but I don't know what is right. And I knew you couldn't solve it with SQL. I knew you couldn't solve this problem. I mean, people weren't using these things for no reason. They were using it because the database didn't do it. And then I met Moham and he explained that really these are all, you know, the reason people are, are having to build these gigantic feature tables is because the relational algorithms that were in, inside that database are insufficient to solve the problem. But it's not fundamental to the relational algebra or relational calculus. Mm -hmm. It's the implementations. And he explained to me something I, I knew, but I didn't understand the alternatives, which is that every SQL database, you know, from system R to Snowflake and BigQuery, all does binary joins, you know, mm -hmm. where you 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 have two different tables and you have join keys and you join the two together, you get an intermediate result set and then you do it again and you do it again. And I would look at these query plans sometimes that Snowflake, I mean, people would hand us multi-thousand line SQL queries, you know, and and the query plans were ridiculous. I mean, often generated by BI tools. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are those are those were generated by tools. They're always yeah. generated by tools, yeah. but. The query plans were unbelievable. The number of joins and stuff that were required in it, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and then you know, and then there's some things that I knew you couldn't do. If if you know, recursion, for example, and some of the graph-oriented problems, I knew didn't work. And so I was seeing these limitations in the database, and I was seeing people use tools like Databricks with feature tables. And you know, Molham explained to me that these were all because the databases were not using the right algorithms. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that he had been working with uh, researchers around the world to develop a whole new set of relational al al algorithms that did multi-way joins. And um, and so, you know, did them in memory. Remember when, when, when System R was built, like 16K of memory was a massive amount of memory, <laughs> right? And so they had to do things in ways that fit in tiny, tiny amounts of memory. Now we have gigabytes and gigabytes of memory, and we're just not using it. And, and, and we're not using it efficiently in these modern SQL databases. Mm -hmm. But it is possible with new relational algorithms to do all this differently. And that enables different shapes of relational to be applied to essentially arbitrarily shaped objects, which is what a knowledge graph is. Well, and, and certainly the the other characteristic that I, I was, you know, as, as I two plus years ago got introduced to the team in relational AI was the incrementality um, and sort of incrementality as a characteristic of the system. Oh, the, dynamic, you can, the dynamicism that's there. That's the, that gives you these these modularity constructs where where you can start to build things. It, it's 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 very nice that you have data at a very atomic level, right. and you can start to construct knowledge effectively. And in database world, we might refer to these as materialized views and, and views on top of data, but through a, a, a rich language that can really represent that that logic relationally um, and and maintain that and maintain those views and you've got this really nice characteristic where the the atomic level of data uh, can build up concepts on top of it and those concepts can be reused and the relationships from those concepts can be reused and sort of the logic and the rules um, and and what struck me after our conversation I went and and read the case study on um, you know tax accountancy and if you can take uh, some of the complex logic that exists around um, securities analysis and tax liability uh, which which we've seen now and being able to implement those in a knowledge graph I mean that's some very sophisticated uh, logic uh, and semantics that can be represented and maintained in in a knowledge graph and I should I think it demonstrates how far we can go as a technology. Yeah, and, and you could never, and solving these problems using a traditional SQL database and traditional coding techniques is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And, and you're, you know, you're basically putting all the work on the programmer and, and the team creating it to figure out how to do it. And you're not getting a lot of help from your database, really. And you know, these new tools, I mean, they, can, they will change the kinds of stuff that people can build. You know, my main point is, there's nothing wrong with SQL. I mean, well, there are things wrong with SQL. I, I could criticize SQL, but but forget it. I won't criticize SQL. SQL is great for what it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, it just doesn't do everything we want a database to do now. And so the question is, how do you solve that? And 
classically, you know, people have you know, SQL has been so flexible over time. People extended in all sorts of ways. You know, there are some, and you know, like time will eventually tell who believe that it can be extended to solve all these problems. But I don't believe it can, because we're now talking about data of different shapes that it was never designed to work with. So, you know, when we had those issues of of, of ORM mappers and things where we we're mapping, you know. You know SQL could ultimately shape, you could ultimately shape the data in a way in tables and put it into a, a normal form, a third normal form and do it. Now we need to work with data in different shapes to solve some of these problems like graph oriented problems or some of the, some of the more difficult analytic questions that data apps are creating. So, so do you have a sense, Bob, or how do you, how do you think about relational knowledge graphs playing in the modern data stack? And, and, you know, you, you've, been sort of on the leading edge of getting organizations to adopt uh, cloud database technology with Snowflake. And I think we both know that, you know, that's a, that's a large investment for organizations to make. And we talked about sort of new technology and the need for new technology to play with existing technology. And so how do you think about relational knowledge graphs fitting in uh, to the, the modern data stack? It took a little while for us to really understand exactly what that meant. You know, we've now adopted this approach of like being a co-processor to sit on top of, of a modern data stack platform like, like Snowflake. And Snowflake has now, with the, the things they announced at, at, at their conference last, this last summer, they're now announcing the capabilities that would allow a product like Relational AI to host on the data cloud. Sure. and participate within the security model and the data context. So, you know, ultimately, uh, the SQL will sit underneath and be used with together with tools like RAI. Yeah. Um, and I think in particular what's happening now, and I think this is a very good thing, is now that the data lake technology is maturing, you know, with things like Iceberg and Delta, right. I still think those things have to straighten themselves out. I do not like the beta versus beta. We are, we're, it feels very beta VH versus VHS to me <laughs> right now. And I don't think customers should have to make that choice. I think it's right. bad that customers have to make that I choice. I, I really think that's a problem. But we'll put that aside because that's not a problem. That, that Who's the beta in the, from your perspective? Who's beta in this? Uh, in I don't know. I mean, well, I, I think I think ice I I think iceberg has the long term traction. I think iceberg has the long term traction, yeah. but I but that's not one hundred percent clear. I mean, yeah. it, it's 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 yet to be it's yet to be determined. Um, I you know I I I I don't think the technologies are enough. There's enough differentiation in the technologies to warrant two totally different stacks. Mm -hmm. The customers must make a decision on. I mean, this is yeah. like. You have to decide: Are you using this one or this one? At least for the moment, um, I'm hoping the industry fixes that. But what's great about those data lakes is that we can read and write directly to it, mm -hmm. and and it allows it allows relational AI to interoperate with these platforms in a way that is very seamless or relatively mm -hmm. seamless for the customer. Right, I, and I think we see that with, with Snowflake, with Snowpark Container Services, and really having an extensibility model that allows technology like relational AI to plug in to those, those data systems or those data clouds, as Snowflake would call it. But even, you know, some of the, uh, what Microsoft is doing with Microsoft Fabric, uh, they have extensibility models that they're building. They're all going to build it. We, there will uh, be the ability to do co-processors with all five, I think, right. with all five clouds over time. Right. And I, I think that's great for customers because they don't have to make a choice on where they're putting their data and they don't have to revisit these these huge investments that they've made in their their foundational data technology. And that I we'll see how things play out with those open data file formats and things like that, which which presumably would give customers even more choice in terms well, of. Well, I'm hoping that those two homogenize and yeah. essentially become one format, one coherent format over time. And uh, uh, and I do believe, however, that while there may be one there may be standards that enable consistency. I do believe there will be different, implement, there are different implementations. Mm -hmm. So it won't be like there's an open source thing that everybody uses. I actually think you know every vendor will have their own implementation of these things. So customers will still need to choose their cloud, their their data lake cloud provider. Hopefully that doesn't lock them into a bunch of stuff, but they will still need to choose that. And then as we mature, as RAI matures, we can sit on top of, of multiple of those. And we'll, you know, we'll start with working with the Snowflake team, which is a great, great place to begin.
And, and as you talk to, you know, maybe as you're talking to, to, to companies or people are asking your, for your advice in terms of if they've uh, sort of looked at what it means to be model driven, what advice are you giving organizations to get started on, on sort of being model driven and moving to a model driven world? Well, I think, you know, what's important is for people to begin to work with these machine learning models and begin to build an understanding of those models. I think you can do that in the context of the data platform you've chosen and, and more and more those tools within the data platform. I mean, within a year, those tools are going to mature quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see very rapid maturation in the tools that allow people to incorporate machine learning and these large language models um, into their into into their data stack and in beginning to leverage some of these things to build a variety of different applications. You know, there's some things that are straightforward to do today at some level. I mean, one of the simplest things people can do today, um, uh, which leverages typically vector databases, is you know is is to use uh, uh, augmented generation. Um, retrieval uh, rag it's called retrieval augmented generation where you actually store you take content that you have maybe it's your product support database or your internal knowledge bases and you you store that in a semantic form with through vectorization and then you leverage that and feed it into the prompts of these large language models you can do things like that pretty straightforwardly today I think people will do that I also think we're in you know I I, I think we were joking a little bit ahead of this this call that 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 you know, we we've seen this last nine months has been the greatest hype cycle I've ever seen in technology history. I've never, I've never seen the volume up higher than this. Let me tell you. I mean, it's internet or internet was pretty big. All these things, but the, this AI thing has been and in the pace. I think is really something that we fast. haven't seen before. It's interesting that in you know the latest Gartner reports, you know, for their hype cycle, which I really believe in the Gartner hype cycle model. They've got they've got uh, large language models pretty much at the very top of the hype cycle, mm -hmm. which means it's about to enter the trough of despair. Yeah, and and I think we're personally I think we're in you know we're starting to go into that trough, and we're waiting for the applications to ship. Basically, and is that because you do you see that happening because we don't have the right stack or the right technology? Well, it's just too early. Everything's still coming together. The apps aren't there. The stuff's not. I'm saying, hey, in a year the data platform will be great. Hey, in a year, Microsoft will release all their office stuff. Hey, in some number of months, we'll see all these other apps. I mean, we're waiting for the apps to appear, right? I mean, search is, you know, we've, we, chat GPT is cool. You know, uh, Dolly and the, the drawing things are awesome. Yeah. Um, so there's some examples, but we haven't seen these broadly applied. I think that, you know, my view is that the hype cycle for AI was super fast. Mm -hmm. The trough will be super short. And I think by mid next year, we will enter what I think Gartner calls the slope of enlightenment. Um, and, and you know, the trough, I think, will be relatively short and will begin as the products start to, because this stuff's real. It's it, it's not like the crypto stuff and the block. I mean, oh, this blockchain stuff, all this stuff is going on. I'm like, this, this, I didn't understand blockchain has purposes, but people were applying blockchain to stuff that it had no business being used for it. It felt like the Hadoop stuff to me. This stuff's different. This stuff's real. And you know, and 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 we for the first time have the ability to bottle intelligence inside a model, mm -hmm. to bottle what we think of as human intelligence, and you know, effectively intuition and things. Because you know, underneath, I do believe we're you know our brain cells are statistically yeah. driven too. And yeah. Well, I think it's, it's interesting, in, in particular, as we talk about uh, capturing semantics, and you talk about all this knowledge that's in people's heads or written in documents and things like that. And so this, you know, how do we bring sort of human and machine intelligence together? How do you take learned models and declared knowledge and bring those together to really have a, a, a system that can make decisions and act and sort of when we talk about those people-centric applications and a lot of them just tell, like give you notifications, but they don't act. They don't actually do something. They don't do something. They don't do things. And now we'll have intelligence that we can put inside the bottle to do to to take those actions. Yeah. And and you know and more and more everyone is realizing that in order for these systems to be effective, we need them to operate with semantic models that they can understand. Right. And that's where the knowledge graph comes in. The other part is is that you know that I think is very is is very important is that the language models. And the, the fact that they can do translations and, and transformations 
um, are a key element in helping to create the knowledge for us right. too. And I mean, this is always something that's very daunting for people, which is, you know, the, the knowledge graph construction and knowledge graph creation. And, you know, sometimes, you know, why certain technologies die just because they're not accessible enough. But I think what we've seen in the potential of language models to aid in knowledge graph, weaving a knowledge graph, constructing a knowledge graph, uh, it, there's, there's really an opportunity there to accelerate that as well. Yeah, effectively, you know, the, uh, one of the things that that hit me this year, and, and it's sort of embarrassing that it took until this year to hit me, is that is that where is, in what form is knowledge stored inside systems? And the answer is, sure, it's in code. It's in code in a lot of places and, and things like that. But really, mostly it's in English or the, natu or the natural language, you know, right. maybe it's French or whatever, but it's, it's the natural language. Right. And, and to really understand the semantic model of a business, you have to start with, with the way humans interact, which is in our natural language. And so that, the fact that these models now have the ability to transform a human el element statement into a canonical form. This is where we talk about the canonical forms of things. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the code that sits underneath it, whether it's SQL or RHEL or Python, whatever it is, that represents what actually happens. But you have to start to think about it, and you should start to think about all of those languages as effectively ILs, intermediate yeah. languages, that are translations between what these AI systems can create and then what and what and what the computer will actually do and they need to be accessible to humans and that's why that's why i do believe that the combination of language models and knowledge graph will be so powerful yeah and it's interesting that you point that out because i think even gartner you talk about gartner hype cycle and where we are if you look at uh, gartner's view on the ai stack and evolving ai stack uh, i think we see consistently a knowledge graph sitting yeah. central We're um, Gartner's doing some really good work. I mean, ever since Gartner, the discussion about the fabric and 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 the data fabric, they they've done a lot of good thinking in this. I, I believe. I mean, I I think I, I think we're very you know we're very much in sync with where they're they're talking about things. Yeah, I think so. So so you, I've heard you, Bob, predict that uh, AGI is is less than than ten years away. Um, and we talked a little about about data apps, but I, I think. Maybe you and I share the same view. I don't think we're two, three years away from no. AGI. So, so if we do think two year, two, three years down the road, where do you see the the data stack going relative to data applications and the role of knowledge graphs and the role of relational AI in that evolution? Well, I I think first of all that that it's been a whirlwind of a year, to say the least, in terms of of what we've seen announcements of things. We're still waiting, as I pointed, for the real key killer products, the killer apps and things like that, you know, by and large. And you say chat GPT was one, but but by and large, I think the killer apps are are, are yet to come. Uh, I think one of the most important thing that's happened this year is the uh, and this is this is since I wrote the book. I mean, the book is a period of time and all of this has happened since is 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 the the explosion of of open source development in the model mm -hmm. the model based world every day there's a new leader in the open source leaderboard and um and certainly i think meta and and zuckerberg have done a very good thing by open sourcing a very powerful model in the form of llama 2 and if you look right now in the open source leaderboard almost all of the top ranked things are based off of llama 2 um, there's still a distance from chat from from what GPT four has, but they're pretty comparable yeah. to three five. They're in the range of three five right now. Um, so uh, what's exciting is that you know I've been asking scientists and engineers when we will see an open source model that is GPT four capable, and you know they're always like I don't know I don't know um, it's a ways away. But but now you know Meta says they're going to build they're going to train they're I think they're actually training right now a a, a model that it will have similar characteristics to GPT-4. And it's, you know, and I think they will be open sourcing that. So probably within a year, we'll see, um, we'll see or maybe a little longer because it takes a while to go through the, 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 the final training. Um, uh, we will see incredible power in open source models. So I think these things are going to develop very quickly. I think that, that the fact that, that we've seen 
huge advancements in the open source community that is is beyond in many ways the work that that's being done by the frontier model groups, mm -hmm. the open AIs and 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 Googles and everything else of the world. Um, that that this stuff's going to go quickly. On the other hand, you know, it, we're not going to see tomorrow what one would think of as an AGI. But I think by the time we get to the 2030s, it'll be pretty hard to say they're not getting there. Mm -hmm. And you know, what I also believe very strongly is that the 19 is is that the 2030s will be the era of robotics. And um, certainly by the end of that decade, you know, our lives will be surrounded with robots in much the way our lives are surrounded by computers today. That's an interesting note to maybe leave on and people can think about what their lives might look like uh, in the 2030s with with robotics. Uh, don't don't you want you remember remember the Jetsons and Rosie? Don't you want yeah, you, of Rosie? course I want Rosie. I want Rosie. <laughs> I, mean, I love Rosie's personality. I, you know, it'd be great to ha have her around the house. It'd be great to have her around the house. Well, Bob, uh, I want to thank you for joining today. Uh, it's as always, it's a, a pleasure to chat with you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the time and uh, I encourage people to, to pick up Datapreneurs. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, if people want to learn more about Relational AI, I encourage them to uh, contact us through the contact us form on relationalai.com. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, John. Thank you.